they give a small talk about uh, the uh, European Union and Ukraine on one side and Russia. Uh, standoff, its background, its current status and what to be expected. Uh, I have a special interest in the topic, in Ukraine actually, for several reasons. In 2003-2004, I was a personal donor to the campaign of, uh, of Yushchenko, uh, who then won. Uh, since then, or a couple of years earlier, I sit on the advisory board of uh, one of the largest European think tanks, especially powerful in this region. This is the Case Institute in, in Warsaw, with chapters in some of the countries, including Ukraine, of the former Soviet Union. And we follow uh, the, the, the region relatively uh, closely. And last but not least, uh, a group of uh, uh, libertarian economists, members of, uh, of, of the Montpellier Society, uh, before the annexation, annexation of Crimea, uh, we visited Kiev and we tried to prevent the worst of happening, which was uh, uh, Crimea on one side and the economic restructuring on the other. Uh, one of the persons who led the group and whom we left in, uh, uh, in Kiev as an advisor to President Petroshenko was Kaka Benduhidze, uh, a Georgian reformer, uh, uh, a billionaire himself, who quit the job in order to advise first uh, Georgia reforms and then, and then Ukraine. Kaka Benduhidze unfortunately died very young, passed away like eight weeks ago. So now we are trying, you know, the same group of people, we are trying, you know, to put some rationale back into the, into the, into the government policies of Ukraine, but it's not easy, mostly because of the standoff with Russia, because of the uh, situation on the eastern part of the country. So I have a couple of points to make about the background, besides the personal background. Uh, Ukraine has expressed some sort of a uh, interest of uh, closer integration into the, with the European Union uh, relatively recently, in 2007-2008. It was uh, uh, everybody's campaign in the elections, uh, presidential elections of 2010. Uh, the elections were uh, 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 basically with an outcome which uh, put the pro-Russian party in place, but because of the pre-electoral promises, uh, uh, the President Yanukovych uh, kept the, 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 the EU track. So for, it, in, at some point I will compare the Russian and the uh, EU programs for Ukraine as uh, they were uh, launched or designed in the, uh, 2013. Uh, because the conflict between these two programs is very important you know, for understanding of the, of the current situation. Uh, another thing which is important to know about the background of the current standoff is uh, President Putin's personal involvement in the Ukrainian affairs. Uh, as I said, I was following the elections of 2004, uh, and then there was, there, was, there, was, there was a journalist who was following, an economist journal, journalist, at Lucas, who was following the same processes. Uh, and uh, it was obvious that uh, President Putin has uh, too close uh, involvement in the campaign for the party of the regions, or Yanukovych's party. Uh, in the period of like 16 months, he visited Ukraine 19 times and openly campaigned in favor of Yanukovych. Obviously, you know, 10 years ago, we have a situation of another head of state of a neighboring country personally involved in some sort of a, uh, political stakes of the country itself, Ukraine. Um, in 2006-2010, then somewhat center, centrist government of Ukraine, uh, although in these countries you never know which is centrist, which is leftist, which is, which is rightist, uh, in order to, to please the electorate, uh, they kept uh, relatively uh, easy uh, relations with, uh, with Gazprom and Russia. They increased the energy subsidies, energy to households, energy subsidies to households, and energy subsidies to uh, 
uh, to industries. Uh, the energy subsidies, including the debts of the, of the natural gas monopoly of Ukraine, uh, at the level currently, at the level of 15% of GDP. So in Ukraine, virtually nobody pays the gas bill, you know. And because they don't pay the gas bill, you know, nobody pays the electricity bill. So the situation is not sustainable. The government expenditures, because of those programs of, uh, of, of, uh, of seven, eight years ago, the government expenditures are the highest on the European continent to, in relative to GDP. It's about 56% last year, which is I mean, it's simply crazy. Mm -hmm. So, so it, that's like in the former communist times, you know. So, so the government expenditure in the former communist time, times were about you know 60 to 65 percent of GDP. You know, Ukraine is the only country which is close to the tradition, which is very strange. You know, it's a world record. You know, there is no such idiotic government balance. You know, uh, actually, I'm quoting. Kaka Bendukidze, you know, he, his opening remarks in, in March uh, were that Ukraine is to some extent to be blamed itself because of the deep shit he said, you know, Ukraine is in. And he listed several world records in, uh, in, in public mismanagement, public government, governance mismanagement. And one of those was first the high, highest in the world energy subsidies for a country which does not have the resources. So you can have energy subsidies in Iran or Saudi Arabia, but in a country without energy resources, it's, it's basically ridiculous. So uh, uh, President Yanukovych, who was elected in 2009, kept the same tradition. Uh, but, uh, uh, but also, in order to have some bargaining power with, uh, with Gazprom and, 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 and the Russian Federation, he basically embarked upon the proposal of the European Union to sign a free trade agreement. The proposal was there back in 2006. By 2007, 2008, the European Union made a mistake of uh, de developing something like a special strategy for Eastern neighbors, uh, which was called not a free trade agreement, but deep and comprehensive free trade agreement. Deep and comprehensive meaning that uh, the neighboring countries, they adopt EU regulations and EU, uh, especially non-tariff uh, regulations, which basically transfers costs of, uh, uh, of, 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 of the shoulders, of the pockets of the European Union consumers on the suppliers on, or to those who would like to trade. So this led to relatively high uh, uh, terms of trade, you know, for any uh, Ukrainian exporter who would like to trade with the European Union. And then they would sort of squeeze between, you know, Russia loose proposals, you know, for, for custom union and relatively high uh, costs of trade with the European Union. So the European Union was, uh, uh, was, was quite unflexible in, besides the comments many people in Europe made on this, whatever, not very sound and reasonable policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis Eastern neighbors, because then Eastern neighbors are forcefully uh, uh, attached to, 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 to different trade options, forcefully because they themselves would prefer, be this a factory in Eastern Ukraine, Lugansk, for example, or a factory in Western Ukraine, they would prefer trading with the European Union because the, 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 the consumption is much more sophisticated and the revenue you, you, you may gain you know, from trade with a richer partner is much more important than trading with a poor partner. You know, basically, everybody understands that trading with poor, you, you become basically okay, but probably poor you know, down the road. When you trade with, with, with the richer partner, down the road you become richer. So, and it was the story of Eastern Europe, which the European Union, which, by the way, makes sense only as a free trade agreement. So, and this is the only policy the European Union can enforce. So, no other policy, be this in the foreign uh, affairs area or, 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 or regulations or monetary, you know, it's very difficult for the European Union to come to some sort of a conclusion on something. So, but free trade, 
uh, or the so-called common market, uh, is one of the, 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 the hallmarks of, uh, of the European Union. And it's something good which the European Union is doing you know, for, uh, uh, for, 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 for the member states. Of course, you know, there are lots of question marks about uh, uh, tariff and non-tariff barriers for non-members of the Union. Uh, but that's a separate topic. That in this particular case, vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, uh, the problem was uh, that uh, it basically left Ukraine uh, in the, uh, especially Eastern Ukraine, in the economic influence or subsidization area of, uh, of, of the Russian state on companies. So, and it was a very silly policy in the first place. On the, uh, on the side of the government of, of Ukraine, uh, the second place on the side of the uh, 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 European Union. What the European Union could have done for Ukraine or other Eastern neighbor, uh, neighbors, this is to repeat the policy they had in the Balkans. In the Balkans, after the Kosovo crisis of 2001, uh, when an uh, international protectorate managed by the European Union and the United Nations became a country of aggression vis-à-vis -vis a neighboring state of Macedonia. So then everybody realized that it's better to trade than to fight. And for this reason, the European Union unilaterally liberalized its trade with uh, 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 with the so-called Western Balkans, which is mostly ex-Yugoslavia plus Albania, uh, up to 97, 98% even. Of course, these 2% are also important because these were agriculture and wine products, some fish in Croatia, you know, which was the basic export capacity of these countries. But anyway, you know, 98% unilateral liberalization on everything you know, was a considerable boost for those economies, and some of them were not even touched by, 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 by the global crisis of, of 2008. And the second thing the European Union did for the stabilization of the Western Balkans, or ex-Yugoslavia, was to lift the visa regime for, uh, uh, for, for ex-Yugoslavs and Albanians. Uh, why it is important and why it is uh, 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 reasonable policy vis-a-vis -vis Eastern neighbors, in, and Ukraine in particular, uh, it's very obvious. Uh, lifting a visa, uh, uh, visa requirements does not necessarily mean that all Ukrainians will basically go immediately to the European Union because you have travel costs, you have you know, uh, family business, you know, it's not that easy to move around. Uh, but what would have been the sense, and it's very similar to the Western Balkans, uh, Ukrainians would have felt that the European Union treats them differently from the Russians. And second, that they have a prospect. You know, it might be simple stuff like sending your kids to study in Germany or somewhere else, uh, or it might be just tourism business, you know, but it's important that you have this perspective, you know, that you sort of, your future belongs, you know, to something different than, than, than Russia. <coughs> And with, uh, with, uh, with trade, uh, it's equally important. And I believe uh, uh, it would have been possible to liberalize 100%, not 97 or 98%, because the current level of uh, European Union trade liberalization vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine is 72%, and it's relatively high. But what is not included, these are uh, uh, the industrial, some of the industrial, and some of the agriculture products. Vis-a-vis -vis agriculture products, Ukraine already committed to fit the so-called deep and comprehensive free trade agreement requirements, which basically meant that you know Ukrainian pork cannot enter uh, the European Union just overnight. You know when you liberalize, you should stick you know to some of the procedures on the non-tariff barriers side. But what was important was that unilateral trade liberalization would have shown the prospect for the industrial complex and the entrepreneurs of Ukraine that they can have new markets. And if a factory in Lugansk, for example, this is Eastern Ukraine, 
they have now in Lugansk People Republic and that sort of stuff. It's one, one or two factory based uh, city. So the entire produce of this, uh, of, 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 of this city is sold to Russian companies, but the Russians themselves don't use what they buy in Ukraine. So because, you know, for example, there is a, uh, a, a train wagon factory, so it's bought by the Russian railways, and Russian railways just uh, just recycles them. You know, they, they scrap. You know, they buy scrap actually. So, uh, so Russians themselves are sort of stuck into some this uh, this uh, this this stupid old contracts. You know, the Ukrainians themselves don't have an option. You know, to 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 reschedule operations of their enterprises and that sort of stuff. And you know, focus on high-end markets. So at the end of the day, you know, they are victims of some sort of a artificial trade uh, situation. So anyway, uh, the European Union realized that they can do something uh, on the <coughs> trade side only after, uh, after mid-March last year, actually, you know, two days before the annexation of Crimea. So, and their, their, their policy was relatively stupid. Uh, uh, because of the following reason. So they opted, they announced the program, President Barroso announced the program of uh, uh, half, uh, uh, half a billion uh, uh, trade uh, liberalization, uh, which was to be calculated on an annual basis. So you start on 1st of January, you restructure your operations, you sign contracts to export something to the European Union, but it's a uh, 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 real-time calculation. So uh, Ukrainian enterprises export, you know, half a billion. They typically export like uh, six, seven uh, billion to the, uh, euros to the, to the European Union. They, they export half a billion and then, you know, the, 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 the liberalization window is closed. And so, which is costly for those who did not make it in, in real time. So, Everybody would have uh, calculated the cost of risks and that sort of stuff, you know, for this, and it would have been very difficult to handle, you know, which basically requires not only European customs to work okay, but also the Ukrainian customs to work okay. So uh, this did not happen. So what happened afterwards uh, is, uh, uh, is 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 basically uh, known to everyone. Uh, the, the annexation of Crimea uh, led to uh, uh, sort of uh, consolidation of the public opinion in Ukraine. Uh, uh, in the eastern provinces, more towards uh, Russia, in the rest of the countries, uh, more towards the European Union. But what also happened is that the government did not manage to, uh, to, to, to have any sustainable solution to anything. So, and here comes the point of comparing the two programs between uh, the European Union and Russia, how to deal with, uh, uh, with, uh, with the economic situation, especially the foreign debt of Ukraine. Foreign debt of Ukraine was not that high as it is typical for the European countries. It was about, in 2013, it was about 46% of GDP. The problem was the government expenditures and the n n no opportunity to raise the revenues and, uh, and pay 2014 dues of uh, roughly 3 billion, uh, uh, 3 billion euros, uh, 3 billion uh, dollars. The Ukrainian GDP is 176 billion. So besides the fact that it's a small payment, it was not possible you know, to pay this. So the European Union suggested the following. So, uh, we financed the balance of payment with $3 billion. So for the rest of the restructuring program, there are some requirements. Number one is to skip subsidies. Number two is to uh, 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 introduce sound banking policies. And number three, to introduce sound monetary policies. So which was a requirement uh, to come forward with uh, about uh, $19 billion euro. Uh, balance of payment and, uh, uh, and, and, and debt restructuring program. So this offer by the European Union was reasonable. It was built on uh, IMF tradition in 
dealing with such situations. But more importantly, it was reasonable because it was in favor and still is in favor of the Ukrainians themselves because they cannot run their affairs on subsidized gas forever. So sooner or later, you know, we get addicted to this, there is corruption involved, and everybody is unhappy. So uh, in August 2013, as a counterpoint to, to the European Union, IMF uh, proposal, uh, the Russian Federation, President Putin actually, uh, came with, the, uh, uh, with, with an alternative which was somewhat similar in the, in, 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 in the aspect of uh, covering the foreign debt payments, most of it to Russia actually, uh, with 3 billion in 2014, and then a combined uh, 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 further subsidization and uh, other government programs uh, by, 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 by the Russian Federation equal to roughly uh, in total, with the debt payments, uh, roughly 18 and a half, 19 billion uh, 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 dollars. So the trick here was that no condition of the Russian program meant, you know, further dependency of Ukraine and Ukrainian enterprises on Russia. And uh, down the road, it could have led to some sort of um, uh, Belarusian scenario. Uh, Russia was subsidizing energy uh, prices of Belarus for about 10 years. So it was subsidizing uh, different trade deals between Belarusian enterprises and, uh, and, 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 and Russia. At the end of the day, Belarus was not able to pay the debts and, uh, you know, overnight or in a period of like six, seven months, in 2011, 2012, the balance of payment support, Russian balance of payment support for Belarus was converted into equity, and now Russian companies control roughly 45, 46 percent of, of, of the assets of, of, of the Belarusian economy. Of course, you know, if, if everybody agrees with this, you know, there is no political problem. In Ukraine, the situation was just the opposite. Uh, those uh, 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 industrial leaders, those political leaders who had stake in, uh, uh, in, the, in the Ukrainian economy and saw the prospects of further integration with the European Union, they basically opposed President Yanukovych and, of course, they basically opposed uh, the, the, the Russian program. And they financed, you know, the, the street insurgencies. There was no secret about who is backing the people on the street. Everybody came forward with their name, with their cash, including President uh, 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 Petro Poroshenko, and they said, you know, we are here to stay. We are billionaires. You know, we stopped other businesses and we are financing, you know, these street protests. So there was no secret about this. So, but here comes, you know, the, 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 the next, whatever, uh, uh, circle of the spiral. Uh, so because this group of people become more influential and because their promises, you know, coincided with the, the, with, with the dreams, so to say, uh, uh, cherished by, 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 by the majority of the Ukrainians, they were elected. So Russia did not have any other choice besides, you know, forcing the insurgent movements on, on the eastern side of Ukraine. Uh, what is the current situation? Uh, it's basically much worse than, than, than it used to be because of the fact that there is a combination of uh, uh, Russia resolve to sustain the efforts of supporting insurgents of the eastern Ukraine because of the fact that this support is important. I can explain if you have questions why it's, uh, uh, why it's uh, successful. But it's successful and Russia already controls the basic uh, territorial and communication infrastructure of eastern Ukraine, which is important for them because it provides for infrastructure link to Crimea. Otherwise, you know, they, 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 they risk, you know, uh, leaving Crimea without uh, supplies of everything, you know, including goods, including, uh, uh, including electricity. 
but it's a military view on the problem, uh, on the communications uh, between Russia mainland and Crimea. Ukrainians themselves, uh, they had never had the idea of blocking you know, these supplies because the, 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 the business of uh, infrastructure links and the business of uh, electricity and other supplies is such that nobody has an interest of leaving, you know, big chunk of the market just in this situation, you know, just, you know, not, uh, not being serviced because they would have, would have been paid otherwise. So, uh, but the Russians, they have this military approach to the problem, which is very rare. I think this is in the Northern Hemisphere, this is the only probably, besides North Korea, the only country which has this military approach, you know, to international affairs. Um, so another uh, important thing is that this situation is uh, further uh, uh, aggravated by, uh, by, 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 by difficulties of the Russian economy, which come from several sources. They're, uh, they're visible now, but they're there to stay, you know, for probably already at least four years. Uh, uh, and this is the, 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 the prospect of, uh, of lower prices on, on petrol. Uh, wrong calculations of, uh, of, of, of the government expenditures and the annual budget for 2014 and 2015 because the budget was calculated at the level of uh, roughly uh, $100 uh, uh, a barrel. So now you have, you know, like 60 and, you know, it's obviously a challenge, you know, for, for the Russians themselves. Uh, the second thing which was in making, it was the challenge for the Russian export of uh, oil and gas to, uh, to, to big consumers like the, the European Union. So the European Union consumes 10 times more uh, Russian gas and energy resources than China after the completion of the Gazprom China contract in, in 2030. So then if everything's normal, which is quite subject to question, if, then if everything's normal, China will consume like uh, 30 billion uh, cubic meters uh, per annum, uh, which is basically, you know, one-fifth of the current European consumption. So the next trading partner for Russia is, uh, is, is Turkey, which is uh, at the moment 8% of the European consumption. So the Russians themselves, they don't have an option. But they were sufficiently unreasonable to try to avoid Ukraine and created additional problems with the European Union. They, they launched the so-called South Stream project, which is a pipeline coming, you know, under the Black Sea through six countries and supplying, you know, gas to, 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 to Europe. But the European law, European Union law, requires that any third party has an access to the infrastructure because of the common market, because of the competition and that sort of stuff. Russians believed that the European law will not apply to Gazprom pipeline which basically left Russia, you know, with further, I mean, they spent probably 10 billion on constructing this pipeline. And it was obvious, you know, from day one, from 2008, it was part of the problem, you know, to put Ukraine on its knees. Although they are not able to do anything about Crimea and Eastern Ukraine, they will, they cannot allow themselves, you know, living, you know, uh, uh, the European, industries with limited gas supplies. I mean, the, 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 the average import dependency of the European Union on Russian gas, although it's declining, you know, for the last 10 years, uh, is roughly 40%. So you, you risk, you know, sort of 40% of the supplies to, 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 to the largest economy you know, in the world, and it's not okay. So, so what the European Union can do at the moment, this is to cover the payments between Naftogaz, the gas monopoly of Ukraine, to Gazprom. And it is what is going on. So European taxpayers are basically paying the bill, because otherwise they would risk, you know, to, 
to, to, to leave you know, uh, uh, Europe with 40% less uh, gas supplies. So the only option then is that European Union or European uh, gas and uh, infrastructure petrol companies uh, have a stake in the oh, NAFTA gas, the Ukrainian gas monopoly is privatized and is managed by, 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 by the European Union companies like Rurgas, others. Uh, so, which leads to some sort of a prospect for relatively good co cohabitation, at least on the energy market, uh, between uh, Europe and, uh, and Russia. But it leaves unresolved the political issues and uh, the, 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 the out, outcomes of the military approach you know, to, to international relations, which uh, Putin's administration has for already uh, seven, eight years. So uh, basically, this means also that uh, uh, a significant European stake in the Ukrainian economy will lead to requirements of stabilizing banks, stabilizing the, 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 the budget. And of course, you cannot stabilize a budget in a situation of a military conflict without further subsidies. So, in fact, some sort of a Marshall program for Ukraine, Marshall plan for Ukraine, uh, is something which is doomed to happen but it will be much worse than the actual experience with the Marshall Plan in Europe after the World War II. Because the actual Marshall Plan was conceived and the funding was available when the economy of Europe, except for Germany, was already recovering you know, to the levels of 38-39. So in Ukraine, there is no such pros prospects. There is no viable structure in the country which may, may lead to a similar scenario like Europe after the World War II. So, which basically means that instead of the 19 billion original program, which was reasonable, as I said, and made sense, you know, for for for, for everyone, including the the, the Ukrainians, uh, will cost much more, probably twice more, or even more, in this situation because the political issue is to stay there and instability of the Russian economy is to stay there for an additional period of probably uh, two to three years. The economic situation in Russia will not improve uh, in the next year and a half, two years. The political situation is not very much clear. At the moment it's uh, obvious that uh, uh, the, 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 the Russian federal budget uh, is financed uh, to very much high levels by oil taxes, oil and gas taxes. 54% of the government revenues, federal government revenue, is coming from oil taxes. So this is another reason that the Russia will keep, you know, the trade going on, whatever the, whatever the situation. Uh, and it, this situation with the fiscal area of Russia, with the public finances of Russia, is very different from what they had 10 years ago to some extent because of the lower prices. But 10 years ago, the government oil revenue, oil gas revenue, was equal to 9 to 10 percent of the revenues. So now it is five times higher. So, uh, which does not necessarily mean that cutting uh, electoral promises, uh, putting electoral promises uh, from the last elections would uh, necessarily lead to a political uh, insurgency or, 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 or crisis in Russia proper because Putin has the excuse of blaming the West, the Americans, the European Union, America, you name it, uh, you know, for the situation. And second, uh, the Russian population, it's, 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 it's historic background, you know, they, they know two and two hundred. So when they have two hundred, they believe that sooner or later they will live on two. So, and it's Russian sake, you know, we, we know two and two hundred. So, when you talk now to Russians, they say we know two hundred and we know two. So, but we will survive, they say. And this explains, you know, the, the, the high approval rates of uh, the Putin's administration at the moment. 
Uh, that's in a nutshell. I went a bit over uh, my uh, 20, 30 minutes, but I would be happy to answer questions. Are Western sanctions having any effect on Russia? Uh, yes. More yes, than. mostly. Uh, Mostly because, I mean, there are two major venues of that impact. Number one, these are individuals who have been challenged uh, in their own business relations, in their uh, prospects, you know, of their traveling. So who was affected? These are friends of Putin, personal friends of Putin, with whom he shares, you know, the interventionist, whatever. Uh, mm, uh, way of doing politics in Russia. And number two, which is important, this is, in, uh, this is the, uh, uh, the embargo on technology transfer. So without a technology, uh, Russians cannot exploit neither Caspian, nor Tumen, nor any of the new gas fields. Uh, plus they need supplies you know, for maintaining the existing infrastructure. So the existing contracts are not to be touched, you know, because you know, you don't have a retroactive yeah. force of the sanction. Most of the contracts are long term, but at the same time, the new investment, the new exploration is uh, is challenged. So, uh, of course, Russians did everything possible, you know, to 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 harm their own consumers, you know, further when they imposed, you know. Uh, 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 reverse embargoes, uh, but this reverse embargo uh, is not very significant for the European exporters because some of them have already found ways, you know, to import or to export to Russia vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis Belarus or, or, or some other uh, channels. And uh, and and number two. Uh, they have uh, the impact on them was somewhat mitigated by 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 by, by the global constellation, especially by the lowering uh, prices on uh, on energy. Yeah. So does that mean that there are? And of course, you, you should know that you know Russia is a sort of important country, but uh, you know its economy is twice smaller than 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 Germany. Mm. You know, two and a half times smaller than than Japan or France, so it's actually comparable to to to, to Australian economy. But Australia, with 20, 24 million people, produces you know basically as much as uh, Russia with one hundred forty million, and lots of space, mm -hmm. and lots of energy resources. Sure. So, so if you look at the trade figures. Uh, the, 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 the Russian-European Union trade volume is roughly 10% of the total. So what is affected, uh, you know, is less than 1%, you know, the agriculture uh, exports. So uh, the, 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 the impact is much heavier on Russia rather than the European Union, although you have uh, different, whatever, different challenges on the European Union. Uh, especially agriculture uh, enterprises as well. Mm. Agriculture and fishery. Yeah. Well, it looks like from that that uh, the West will be, will have very little to undermine its resolution to maintain the sanctions. And yeah. uh, what do you think the long term consequences will be if that's the case in Russia? Uh, it's very difficult to 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 avoid uh, 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 compliance with uh, whatever Australian, European Union, or North American regulations. You know, if you're a company, for example, ExxonMobil or Chevron or whatever, you know, with or, or British Petroleum, it's uh, virtually impossible not to comply with uh, with uh, with the law. I think that uh, in 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 short term, this and probably early next year, there will be a further uh, effort of uh, of of big European companies who uh, 
want to invest in the Russian energy resources, you know, to, to lift at least the investment side of the sanctions. As to the, as to the European uh, exporters of farm produce, agricultural uh, products to Russia, I think the, 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 the situation is already uh, pretty comfortable for everyone because they found, you know, uh, all these channels I mentioned. And also for those who cannot claim, can claim losses, you know, there is a, uh, uh, there is a loss coverage program of the European Union. What do you think uh, the response? A part of the agriculture, uh, whatever, common agriculture policy is dedicated to that and the common agriculture policy is 35% of the annual EU, EU budget, which is roughly 130 billion euro. What do you think of Obama's response? Uh, Obama is uh, Obama is pressing. Obviously, uh, the, the recent uh, 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 agreement on uh, nuclear cooperation between uh, uh, United States and India is uh, further uh, hampering, you know, the, the influence of Russia in the region. And of course, it's good, you know, for I mean this. This, 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 this sort of businesses which depend on, on heavily regulated industries like nuclear, uh, they are basically uh, uh, early flyers of, 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 of some, some political change. And I believe, you know, the policy uh, change there will be lesser and lesser uh, Russian influence. So, and going back to the future question, um, uh, there was a government think tank, Russian government think tank paper, what are the prospects for Russia in this situation, and they've mentioned three options. Option number one, Russia becomes a normal country and uh, forgets this military approach to economic and international affairs. Uh, number two, Russia becomes a uh, uh, backyard province of China in terms of, uh, of economy. And number three, uh, they're involved in a, uh, some sort of a tricky combination of cold, cold and warm wars on its own territory and with neighbors. And, uh, as soon as this week there was uh, the Institute of Humane Studies uh, uh, report on Russia and they uh, they spent some effort listing all these uh, conflicts Russia is involved at the moment. Uh, it's in the list of, of sources, actually. And there are 13 such conflicts Russia is involved. You cannot handle too many of them. So there, there is a possibility of disintegration of Russia itself. What, what the impression I get from listening to the news is that there's an ethnic division in, in the Ukraine that predominantly, well, a substantial Russian population on the east and whatever the Ukrainians are on the west. Is that, is that a correct, um, uh, or is that a homogeneous population in Ukraine? I mean, then the next question is, is there a possibility of Ukraine dividing into a pro-Russian or a, a predominantly Russian? No, oh, it's 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 already divided. It's already divided by 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 the subsidies program, which were in place, you know, for for the last twenty years. Uh, it's already divided because of the uh, Russian supported insurgency, and it's obvious. Uh, as to the public opinion, it's difficult to 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 have a confirmation of uh, different public attitudes on the spot in eastern Ukraine. Uh, there is anecdotic evidence, you know, uh, which basically tells me when I meet these people, because I was in Ukraine and Ukrainians are one of the frequent travelers to Bulgaria, they own properties and that sort of stuff. I never met a person from Eastern Ukrainian, be this on the, on the sea coast or in the mountains, you know, in the winter resorts, who basically dislike the European Union. And if they are normal persons, they would obviously, you know, uh, prefer the, the, the conditions of life or style of life which is closer to the European Union than to, 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 to the Russian backwaters. Uh, and the last evidence uh, of some uh, pro-European, I think, 
uh, uh, public mood in eastern provinces is the electoral results of the elections in Ukraine. So basically, in eastern provinces, in the constituencies which were allowed to vote, you know, the current Ukrainian administration and president were supported. As strongly in the east as in the west? No, no, but uh, with significant number of votes, close to 50%. Yeah. In, the, in, the, in, in the constituencies, they were allowed to vote. There were, were, there were free elections. So in the constituencies, there were no free elections. You cannot tell. Mm -hmm. I mean, so there is no evidence. Uh, at the same time, I, I would like to mention that the so-called Russian speaking is, is, is no criteria. So all Ukrainians speak Russian. When we were there, uh, this group of libertarian economists from around the globe, actually, uh, in March, we were asked, those of us who, who knew Russian, to speak in Russian. And the entire conference, 1,000 uh, people discussing the economic policies and Crimea prospects and that sort of stuff in March, everybody was speaking Russian. So. So is there in fact an ethnic group, an identifiable Ukraine, Ukrainian population ethnic group? Uh, yeah, you can, you, can judge by, you can judge by name, by family name. Okay. Yeah. Well, what language do they speak as their first language? Uh, the, 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 the families with Russian background, they speak, uh, they speak first Russian, yeah. but they understand also Ukrainian. Me, I mean, the Slav languages are... are <laughs> much more closer one to another than, than for example, Germanic languages or Anglo-Saxon languages. Mm -hmm. So uh, knowing Russian and Czech, I understand Polish, Ukrainian, Serbian, Macedonian, and virtually every, every Slav language. You know, not fluently, but you know, 50% of the text and 60 to 70 percent of the talk, mm. you know, you would you would get. Of course, you cannot read poetry, <laughs> but uh, it's very very convenient. Uh, <laughs> I mean, not much because you know when the languages are too close, you know, you always mix them. You know, so you start speaking Polish and you switch to Czech, or you start speaking Ukrainian and switch to Polish, or you start speaking Serbian and you switch switch to Macedonian or Bulgarian. You know, so. So, to what extent do you think that this Russian military approach to economic affairs is going to impact the other countries in that region? The other countries? Oh, the most important here is, and, and it was a focused, destructive impact on the Ukrainian army. So, the Ukrainian army was first equipped only with Russian equipment. It was second-hand. Uh, much worse than the Russian army itself. And second, you know, there were different programs which led to a corruption of the, of the army. This is a Russian policy for centuries, actually. So, uh, so they would like, you know, to, 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 to be involved in the conflict. They, they would first, you know, corrupt the army. It, they were doing this in the Balkans, you know, and from Bulgarian or Serbian or, or Romanian history, we have these examples, you know, for ages. But what was happening, actually, between uh, uh, Yushchenko's victory of uh, December 2004 and 2013, it was destruction of the morals in the army. And of course, support to, 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 to chauvinistic, anti-Semitic and uh, 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 Nazi, uh, uh, Nazi parties in Ukraine itself. And Russians do this, you know, with such parties in the rest of Eastern Europe, be it is, uh, the Baltics or the Balkans. They do this. So there is an evidence of, of, of them doing this. So, in fact, if Ukrainians were ready to, to fight over Crimea, for example, they would have received some support, probably symbolic. You know, if you have, you know, NATO advisors, for example, in Crimea, you know, it will be very difficult, you know, to invade. Or if you have, uh, you know, exercises or advisors or trainers uh, in eastern Ukraine, it will be difficult, you know, to deal with financing, you know, the insurgents, including the rockets and, uh, and, 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 uh, and earth uh, 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 air rockets, you know.
mm. which led to this international tragedy. So, but the morale of the Ukrainian army was, uh, was very low and it was proven corrupt when different units of the Ukrainian army, when the insurgency started, you know, like, uh, like a year ago or, or later, no, probably eight months ago, you know, several battalions, you know, just switched the sides, you know, overnight. Mm -hmm. So, and then Brzezinski said, you know, okay, we are ready to help the Ukrainians, but we have no evidence that they can fight. Mm -hmm. So, the, 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 so the, the, the influence on other armies in the region, I mean, it depends. Um, most of the countries, I mean, the Baltics, which are former Soviet republics, uh, the Baltics are members of, of NATO, the Balkans are most of them, I mean, Bulgaria, Romania, uh, Turkey, Greece, uh, members of NATO, uh, ex-Yugoslavs, including those who are members of uh, the European Union, like Croatia, they have very strong cooperation with, uh, uh, with NATO. Uh, the Russian influence is more through different political dealings, you know, in, in the public supplies. Because part of this uh, uh, situation with the Russian influence is the, 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 uh, the current equipment or the past equipment, which was as, as, as a legacy of the Warsaw Pact was, was, was totally, uh, totally Soviet made. So, and for the new member states of the European Union and NATO, uh, it's quite a challenge to finance, you know, this, uh, uh, this re rearmament or re-equipment of the army. Uh, but most of these new Europe member states, plus uh, some of the former uh, Soviet republics, they have, uh, they have good relations they are either members or have good relations with NATO. So the influence uh, on the army of Armenia is stronger than on the army of Georgia. But the situation in Georgia is changing because of the change, change of, in the administration. So the current administration is much more pro-Russian than the previous one. So the same is the situation in, uh, uh, in Moldova. Moldova used to be pro-Russian, but now it's more pro-Western. So it will last until probably the next elections, and then you have something different. But also Moldovian situation is, uh, is also uh, much more complicated than, for example, Armenia, because they have Transdristria, which is you know, some sort of a breakaway territory you know, of, of, of Moldova, you know, which recognizes only the Russian rubble and, and, and the government in Moscow. To what extent do you think the economic weaknesses in Western Europe uh, would impact that sort of the entire situation there between, say, Russia and Ukraine, but the other countries there as well? To what extent? Yeah. Oh, extent is something measurable. <laughs> I, I, I cannot measure. I think there is a probability of a probability of a of 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 a eventual good outcome of the situation because. For the Russians themselves, it's not, it's not interesting, you know, continuing this forever. Mm -hmm. But on the other side, you know, you, you never know. It's very difficult to put an exact figure on the probability. So for this reason, I was speaking of possibilities, not so much probabilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what exists is possible. So what existed is possible. So there were relatively good relations in the uh, oil and gas infrastructure industries. There were relatively good trade relations. Uh, there were relatively good policy relations. So what existed is possible. What is and less, uh, so less costly. <laughs> what are the Bulgarian for uh, mixed feelings or what? Uh, uh, Bulgarians, uh, they're sort of uh, divided. I would have uh, say, you know, probably 50-50, but they're divided more along the political lines, you know. Those who would vote rather leftist, ex-communist, uh, because leftist in Bulgaria means ex-communist, they would be rather uh, pro-Russian, so to say. So, but even they, uh, because of the Ukrainian conflict and the standoff between the EU and Russia in Ukraine, 
even they become less uh, Russophiles. So the strongest support for, uh, for, for Putin policies in our country, this is not only Bulgaria, uh, comes from, from Nazis. So, and our Nazis, they are, they're, they're left wings. They would like to nationalize the economy. They would like to kick out all the foreign investors and that sort of stuff. So, they would like to have government property on everything, including land and that sort of stuff, so, uh, which, is, which is, of course, stupid, but they have like 10 to 15% of the population. And uh, uh, the majority of the population would never opt for, for, for such policies because everybody I mean, everybody appreciates what was happening, you know, in the last 25 years in our countries. But similar is the, uh, the, the policies of the Nazi, similar are the policies of Nazi parties in Ukraine or Slovakia or to extreme Nazi, whatever, chauvinistic parties in Romania. So, and all of them very, uh, have very close relations to um, uh, United Russia, Putin's party. To Putin's party and the Moscow Patriarch. Would you say that Putin's been significantly weakened by this adventure? Domestically not. Domestically not. In terms of the population, in terms of friends, uh, I think you know he he will be replaced by friends. Friends like those, yeah. Need enemies like yeah. That. So they will find another friend. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much for thank you. That. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. 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 Thank you